This is episode six of the Wiener Dog Lover podcast. Today's guest is Katra Corbett, and I'm your host, Laurie LeDuc. Do you have a dachshund and have questions on topics like training and nutrition? Do you want a dachshund and need help locating a breeder or finding a great rescue? Did you have a dachshund growing up and want to share some funny or heartwarming stories? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to the Wiener Dog Lover Podcast, the place to be for all things dachshund. I've said it before, but it's worth saying again. My goal for this podcast is to help you create a long and loving relationship with your dachshund. My guest today is doing just that. Katra Corbett is an ultramarathoner with a long list of racing stats that are only outdone by her wiener dog, Truman. Today is a special birthday episode, and I'm thrilled to have such an inspirational female athlete, animal lover, and wiener dog mom. Before we head into the interview, I just want to mention two things. First, neither Katra or I are medical professionals for either pets or humans. It's important to check with your vet and your doctor before starting any kind of diet or exercise program. Katra and I do briefly discuss the reality of being a meat eater. It's not shocking, but it is real. If you have young children close by, you may want to put the headphones in and have a listen first. Welcome, Katra. I'm so grateful for you taking the time to speak with me. You're such an inspiration. You've overcome addiction. You've lived through personal loss and struggle and through physical pain of running plus 100 mile races. Where do you find your strength? I mean, it's not something I'll be able to do forever, so I'm enjoying it while I can, and, and that's why I do it. And it also helps, to, you know, keep me clean and sober, and it helps me, you know, to have a purpose and a passion and, and to keep me going, you know, and keeping me on the right track all these years for the last 25 years, pretty much. It's amazing. I think before we get started talking about your four-legged training partner, uh, maybe we could share how you <laughs> <laughs> how you found yourself on the path uh, from getting an F in phys ed to becoming an ultra marathoner. <laughs> yeah. So when I was in high school, I hated sports. I hated anything to do with running. I did not like sweating, and I was a very much a girly girl. And I was actually in. I played soccer and softball only because my dad was the coach. And my parents kind of forced me into playing these sports, but I absolutely hated running. So in school, I would I would refuse to dress, you know. So I, you know, obviously I got an F because I wouldn't participate. <laughs> and so now look at me. It's funny to think back then that I absolutely hated anything to do with exercise. And, you know, now look at me. I'm the complete opposite of that girl who I was back then. A- absolutely. Things change as we get older. I think we develop a, a lot uh, different interests for sure. I was listening to another interview that you gave and you spoke about your book, Reborn on the Run. I immediately went and downloaded it and think I read it pretty much all in the same day. And you're in your book, you briefly, it, it's really good. I really enjoyed it. Congratulations on, on writing that. Thank you. In the book, you briefly mentioned how you were introduced to your dachshund by your boyfriend at the time. Uh, could you maybe just share a little bit more about your first dachshund and how that led you to becoming a wiener dog lover? Sure. Wiener dog lover? <laughs> well, yeah. So this ex-boyfriend of mine some 25 years ago or more, his family always had dachshunds. And they were actually, they, they were from Canada. And so they... For whatever reasons, his family, they had dachshunds since he was growing up. Like, he's never not been around a dachshund. I mean, even now, the guy still has dachshunds. So when he was growing up, that those were his brothers and sisters, the dogs. So when I got together with him, they had this dachshund named uh, Twinkie. And she was, I was afraid of dogs at the time. Because I had been bit a few times growing up. And I was just terrified for do- from, of dogs. Little, big, didn't matter. I mean, they, they were just terrifying to me. Their dachshund was really sick. She had cancer. She was blind. And she was crazy. Like, she would, when I'd come over to visit, she would, like, run at me and bite my ankles. Like, they know where you're at, even if they're fine. And so I was, like, freaked out. So after she ended up getting put to sleep because she was really sick, they got another dachshund named Dee Dee. And it was kind of like all of our dachshund because I lived there at the time. And so 
me and him ended up breaking up and, and, and I was really close to Dee Dee Dachshun and they actually, I had like weekend visitation. So I would get to see her after we had broken up. And then at one point he's like, well, why don't we just get you a Dachshun? I'll pay for pay half. And I was like, okay. So I got, ended up getting a puppy and I will never get a puppy again, <laughs> you know, cause there's so many good rescues. So anyways, I got this puppy and his name was Oscar Meyer Wiener. Of course I named him that. <laughs> And he was just a great little guy, and he was, I'd take him running, but he would only do a few miles, and I mostly took him out hiking, because I was just starting to get into running at the time, so he was my, like, cool down, down guy, so I'd run, like, my five miles, and then I'd go walk around the neighborhood with him after, and, and I'd take him out on the trail, so he ended up get, having surgery, and then he passed away, and then I got another, I ended up getting a rescue, and his name was Rocky Ridge, so he was my third dachshund now, I guess, yeah. And so I ended up getting Rocky Ridge, and he was actually half dachshund and half Jack Russell Terrier. So he was a really good runner. He he liked to run up to about nine miles at a time. And so when I adopted him, we weren't really sure of his age, but he, he was around three and three or four. You can't really tell for sure. And anyways, he ended up getting really sick and died suddenly, and it was devastating to me. So he was about... 11 when he passed away and it was all of a sudden like there was nothing wrong with him and he just got really really sick and it ended up being um she the vet thinks he had like an aneurysm or something like that occur you know because it just he completely like went from being totally fine to like dying the next day so i was really really upset and sad and i was like i don't want to get another dog for a long time so and I was talking to my old roommate at the time, and he was retired, and he does all this volunteer work. And so we both started volunteering at the shelter, and then I just didn't have a lot of time to do it. So I ended up, you know, because the, the hours and the days they wanted me to be there, I couldn't really be there because I had another job, too. So he was retired, so he was volunteering there. And then I said, hey, you should be, because he wanted to, you know, he was hoping to have, like, a rescue at the house, like a uh, fostering at the house, and they didn't let you do that through the uh, – Humane Society where he's working. So I was telling him, oh, there's this dachshund rescue, you know, online. We can foster for them. So he contacted them, and, like, the next day a dog came. That's <laughs> awesome. So that's, yeah, so that's where it all started. So, and he wasn't, you know, he really liked my dog Rocky, but he wasn't a big dog fan. You know, he could take it or leave it, you know, but he would watch Rocky when I was gone. Well, this little dog, her name was Sky. He named her Sky that came. He was getting her ready to put her up on the adoption site, and he goes, I don't know what to do. He goes, I think I want to keep her. And he goes, what do I do? And I go, well, you'll know if you want to keep her. And, he, and she's really friendly and outgoing. So ended up, he ended up adop adopting her. <laughs> so the first one was a failure on his part. So we had several others come in, and I would take them and train them and take them out running and on the trails and get them acclimated with people, and you write up a whole report on them, and then you put it up on the website, you know, their whole bio. And so Truman was like a fifth one that came and he, my, I was out of town and I was on my way back and my roommate messaged me and goes, we got this little dachshund and he's afraid of everything. So when you get home, he's going to be hiding. And so just to let you know, we got this little boy that we're fostering. So I came home and I looked behind the couch and there was this poor little guy curled up in a ball shivering. And I was like, Oh my God, this is so sad. So I coaxed him out eventually and kind of grabbed him and sat with him and started working with him. And that's how Truman came, and I ended up uh, being a foster failure, too. I was getting ready to put him up on the adoption site after I started working with him, and I was, you know, taking him out and walking him, and he got to even work. So I took him to a trail one day out on the trails where I run, and I took him off leash, and he started following me when I ran. So that's kind of my story of how I got I just like went into the long-winded of all my doctors. That's awesome. <laughs> but that... I'm a lover of the breed. I mean, the breed is just such. They have. There are such characters. Every doctor I've ever met is just like they're so funny and they're all different. Every single one of them. That's so true. I I have three now that are all rescue and. Oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> I've had for many years. I my grandfather introduced me to them to my first one many years ago, and it was kind of a a rescue before we even knew rescue was a thing. And we've had 
a dachshund in our family ever since so it's pretty uh or once you become a, a wiener dog lover i think it just gets in your blood and it's you can't get rid of it so i don't i don't think that's a bad thing i love the name rocky ridge by <laughs> no. the way. rocky ridge that's a great name <laughs> that was great yeah when he came to me it was a different name it was felix and i'm like uh no you know they found him on the street so yeah I'm like, that's a cat's name and i was out <laughs> you know how i got the name i was out running on a trail and I'm like, I need a different name for him, something more masculine, something cool, something that has meaning. And I was like, oh, I was on this trail. It's called Rocky Ridge. I'm like, oh, that's going to be his name, Rocky Ridge. So I started taking him running on that trail. <laughs> that's great. Before we move on from your book, where can people get a copy of your book? They can get it on Amazon. So it's available there. Or if they want an autograph copy, and we can do a potograph too. Truman oh, has that's a little awesome. stamp pad. <laughs> they can actually, yeah, they can actually email me at search. D-I-R-T, Diva, D-I-V-A, 333 at gmail.com, and I'll give them the information. So it's Dirt Diva, 333 at gmail.com if they want to get an autographed copy through me, and otherwise they can order it on Amazon. That's great. Actually, I think what I might do is I will order one with a pot of a graph and I will set, give it as a donation for our, we have a Wiener Docs, uh, what's it called? Wiener Palooza here in Calgary. And I'll uh, put the, donate that for a little bit of a fundraiser for oh, our rescue. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. I work with Alberta Docs and Rescue. Perfect. <laughs> so I, mm-hmm. I'm totally like you. I'm a firm believer in, you know, letting dogs be dogs and I absolutely loved when I heard that you ran with Truman. Uh, could you just let us know more about, um, well, I guess we talked about how he came into your life but and how you started running with him. So maybe just give us a little bit of a rundown on his his stats. Sure. So, so yeah, I started taking him on the trail, and he was afraid of everything. But running seemed to be a thing, like being out in, in the wilderness. And he doesn't. he's not a typical dachshund. He doesn't chase anything. He doesn't even know what a toy is. So. He just touched base, like where he came from. He his um, home was uh, a woman that was kind of a hoarder of dogs, and she had 22 of them. And I guess she started out just having a few because she got him as a puppy, and he was actually sick, so she had no intentions of breeding, you know, using him to scud. But she did have puppies she got rid of and mothers, and so I think she started out just meaning well and got in over her head with all these dogs, and so obviously she had to get rid of them, and she, which was nice, got you know, a touch with the docks and rescue and, and gave them to, uh, you know, all of us to, you know, um, foster and then give away, you know, to find forever home. Right. So that's where he came from. So I think his, in his first six years, he was low man on the totem pole because he seemed to be very fearful of everything. And I think he didn't interact with those other dogs. He must have just been afraid, you know, and then he came into that group and so, you know, the pecking order, he must have been the low guy is all I can think of. And he never learned to play with things. So I think, obviously, when you have that many dogs, you know, not all of them are going to catch on and know what to do if you don't have, you know, teach them these things as puppies. He doesn't know fetch. He doesn't know any of that, which is probably a good thing for running. He stays right with me. And yeah. he doesn't go after a squirrel. He doesn't chase a cow. He doesn't he, – he avoids other dogs even, you know, and it's just like he'll – that's a perfect that's running I mean. partner. <laughs> I, I exactly. That's what everybody said. How do you keep train Truman to stay with you? And I'm like, Truman trained himself. <laughs> I have nothing to do with this. He taught himself. So, anyways, yeah. So that's how I kind of started running with him and working with him and training him. So what I did is I ended up starting him. You know, like you would train a person. You know, so I took him out. You know, the first few runs, just a couple of miles. You know, and we'd run, walk, run, walk. But it didn't seem like he really needed to walk. So I just thought, you know, and I'm not running at a fast pace. I was going monitoring him and letting him go at his pace, sure. you know, and that's really important if you're going to run with your dog. You, you know, let your dog go at its own pace. And especially having a small breed dachshund, you know, like Truman. I mean, they have short bodies, but they can haul butt. I mean, <laughs> when you see them in the wiener dog races, that's for a short distance. Truman can do that for a long time. But he is just, I mean... And people look at dachshunds and don't really think of them as a running dog. Even my friends that are veterinarians, they say that they learn in vet school that these dogs are the poster children for bad bats. So you shouldn't do anything with these dogs. And I clearly, Truman has broke the mold on that because his vet is even like, you know what? It makes absolute sense that these dogs should exercise and run. He goes, they're low to the ground. They're not jumping up on things. It's keeping them 
you know, toned and slim. So it's, it is actually good for them. So, Absolutely. I totally so I tra- agree. started training him. Yeah. Just like a person. And he's ramped up pretty quickly. I mean, the first, within the first few weeks of me running with him, I put him in a 10 K and he did really well, you know, first doing races, I mean, he was nervous because it was all people tons of beat around him, you know, it's yeah. like, ah, so we start <laughs> in the back and work our way and pass people. And so then he got really familiar with, when he got a bit, you know, and I pinned a bib on his little harness, he knew that he was in a race and that we were running and we were going to try to pass all these people. So he took on to it really well. It was really cute to watch him. So that's how I worked it. I just worked his way up and he ramped up pretty quickly within his first year. He was doing 20 miler. First year of him running, he did a marathon. And then the next year I did a, I put him in a 48 hour race. I was doing a 72 and he wasn't going to run the whole 48, but I had him come back and pace me and like in the afternoon my roommate would take him home but it was still he was officially in the race and so he did his he did 32 miles in that 48 hours but he was just coming back and forth but that had been the farthest he ever ran so at that point and then I decided well he could do a 50k so I signed him up for a 50k and he was able to do it I mean we just took our time and made sure he ate and drank but he never got fatigued and laid down like you you would know that a dog gets really tired and they stop, but Truman has never done that, which is amazing and kind of scary too. <laughs> so he's never, even when he slows down, he just goes slower. You know, he'll just walk trot slowly, but he's never like got to that point where some dogs, they're, they're just exhausted when they're out on a run and they lay down, you know, like right on the trail. He doesn't do any of that. My other dog, Rocky, would do that. He'd go on strike when he got tired and Truman hasn't done that. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. So, yeah, we just worked our way up, and I mean, it, it still surprises me that he was able to go this far. You know, he's done 31 miles, 50K five times, and this year, you know, he's 12 now, so he's slowing down, and he did his last 50K this year, and he did his fastest time in six hours and 36 minutes, and so he's starting to slow down, and so he's developed a heart murmur, and we're watching that, and my vet just said, yeah, let's take him down a notch, you know, maybe about 20 miles every other week you know, shorten his run. So I don't take him past 15 and really now it's just more like 13, but he could still do a, what a 13 miler each week and he's fine. Like doing one long run. He doesn't ever get tired, but I'm just keeping an eye on his, you know, his heart and making sure that that's okay. Because I even told my vet, I said, if this is something that's going to shorten his life, I'll stop him from running now. And he said, no, 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 don't stop him from running. Yeah. He goes, it, that's, it's not, a bad thing for him it's just at you know when dogs get older they develop this and he goes and it's clearly not affecting him because he's not you know collapsing on a trail and laying down or anything he goes just we'll cut his mileage down so yeah he's being really good it's just amazing like i said that some a dog that little could do that and i actually have gotten x-rays of his spine for people that are wondering like that's bad for your dog to run him that far and it's like nope his spine is totally fine there's no no problems and he's had very few injuries other than eye injuries. And as you see the pictures, he wears the little goggles because of him getting eye injuries. <laughs> yeah, so they're low to the ground. So that's important. I always tell people if you, because a lot of people are emailing me now, like, oh, we want to start our docs and running. And I'm like, okay, hold your horses. I go, not all of them are going to be ultra runners. I yeah. feel as far as I know, Truman is one of a kind right now on this realm. But people are doing half marathons with their docs, which is great. I mean, and I just told them if they take them on trails, please make sure you protect their eyes because that is Truman's had eye surgery because he's gotten stretched cornea and it happened more than once. He's only had one surgery, but he's probably since I've had him these six years, he's probably had about 10 eye injuries. <laughs> now that he's with the goggles, he's had zero injuries and knock on wood this year, nothing. And usually he gets an eye injury once or twice a year. But they do nothing since they got him to pretty much wear those all the time. He must look pretty cute with his little race bib. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he does. <laughs> and those goggles, people, you know, like we were on the trail up at 9,000 feet elevation yesterday. I took him on a short run and people were like, oh, my God, I love these glasses. And they're like, oh. they think that I'm doing it just for like show. And I'm like, no, no, no. He wears these for eye injury. You know, because Wears these little outfits that my friend makes, and they're actually to protect him from the sun. These little jackets that he wears are really thin, 
And his coloring, as you know, is kind of unique, Isabella Dapple. Mm -hmm. And I read up on when I first got him, I was like, what the heck kind of dachshund is this? I've never seen this color in my life. I mean, not in a magazine, not in a book. And they get an alopecia, like, when they're puppies and they lose a bunch of hair usually on their, uh, the, the fawn color and it goes away like they, you know, their hair falls out and doesn't come back. So that happens to most Isabella Dapple puppies from what I've read. And so he has very thin fur. So I put sunscreen on him or I put these little jackets on him. So it's not, I, even though he looks cute, it's for a purpose. Yeah, it's multifunctional. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, he's just, I mean, it's just incredibly crazy that, I mean, he is able to do what he does. And I am just so impressed. I mean, when I'm struggling in a race, I'm like, okay, the wiener dog can run a 50K. I can certainly get through this 100 miler because a 50K is like a 100 miler for his little leg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. I also, I love that you called him your pacer. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so he's come out to races at the end of a 100-mile race. And actually, at the end of a 200-mile race, he has paced me the last, like, 15 miles to the finish line. That's awesome. That's so amazing. Yeah, uh, he's, he's amazing. Uh, well, so we, we've talked about um, uh, Truman's race stats. but uh, And I'm sure, like we've said, you take quite the back seat, I'm sure, when he's out running between his little outfits and, oh, um, yeah. and his goggles. <laughs> But uh, maybe yeah, they don't care about me. They're like, wait, you run two hundred miles, so what? The wiener dog is run fifty k. No, absolutely, that's so funny. I that would totally be me. I'd be all over the little wiener dog, thinking he's so amazing. <laughs> yeah, they are. But uh, but you're just as inspirational. Maybe you could just share some of your amazing accomplishments um, on your ultras. I know you've done. Oh. I I can't remember. I know I heard it, but how many ultras have you done now? Oh, God, almost 300 ultra marathons. I've done um, 138 100-mile runs or more in races. Yeah, I've done a lot. I mostly am doing like 100 and 200-mile races, which I really enjoy being out there for long periods of time, believe it or not. <laughs> Most people are like, what? You know, but I go, it's just, it's a challenge, and it's just, I enjoy it, especially the 200-mile races. When people hear 200, they're just like, oh, my God. But in a 100-mile race, you actually don't sleep. That, you're just going as fast as you can and getting to the finish within 30 to 36 hours in a 100-mile race. But in these 200-mile races, since it is through the mountains and it's spread out on a longer period of time, they allow for you to have sleep breaks in the time. So the race that I'm doing, it's around Mount St. Helens um, this Friday, and they give you 109 hours to finish it. So that is allotted for you to have sleep breaks. And usually I take a total of five hours sleep break, but I'll take one at like three hour or a hundred miles into the run. I'll take a three hour sleep break and then go. And then towards the end, I'll take maybe a one or two hour sleep break. People think, Oh my God, how could you run 200 miles? But you're, you're taking breaks. So, and I mean, the front runners usually don't sleep that much, but they still are going to get some sleep breaking in. And, a lot of it is more self-supported. So like a 100-mile race, you've got a lot of support along the course and aid stations, you know, every usually 5 to 10 miles. In a 200-mile race, it's very remote. So these races are put on like where you have to carry a lot of supplies in case you're caught in a you know, rainstorm. You need to be carrying um, a rain jacket with you or a rain poncho. You need to have extra food because you may – be five hours in between an aid station in in a hundred mile race, you're not any longer than a three hours or two and a half hours to an aid station. But these, you're like five to seven hours could be depending upon how fast you're moving, because you're going like twenty mile stretches with no aid. So I always tell people it's more like as if you're on a fast packing adventure, but you're just moving fast and light. So it's called fast packing when you do that on the trails. And that's how I feel these 200 mile races are more like a fast pack. So, and it, you just get to explore these amazing places and, you know, traveling on foot. And I figure, well, since I'm a runner, why not, you know, do these 200 mile races? And I actually really enjoy those because you're out longer and you're exploring these really cool places. So, that's amazing. Do you have pacers on a 200 mile race? I, like, I can't even fathom. You do. So, but I don't have uh, this race coming up. It's called Bigfoot 200 in Washington. It's just so remote. It's even hard to even get a crew. I mean, some people will have crews and pacers, 
I do a lot of these by myself. I, it's, there's so much support at the aid stations, and I don't really need – I mean, the pacers are great in the middle of the night, especially on the second night <laughs> when you're really sleepy. But you – in these events, a lot of times you'll hook up with another runner and go through the night with them. You know, you're like, oh, let's stick together, you know, because you're both tired, and you're like, well, we don't want to go off course. And the thing with these 200-mile races as well, you have to carry – your phone and you have your map downloaded on it because they have to mark the course like a week in advance to two weeks. And so things can happen, you know, a storm can come or people can vandalize. So you're required to have these maps on your phone. And you're also required to wear a, like a spot device, which is a GPS, so they can track you during the run. So if something does happen to you, they'll see you off course and they'll be like, oh, we need to, you know, get a rescue for this person or whatever. So you hook up with people, but yes, like when I do the Tahoe one here in California, I'm going to have friends come out because Truman is going to come out too, and they'll they'll crew me, and then I'll try to have him um, pace me again at the end, like the last 15 miles of the race. Yeah, I'll have a crew there just because it's easier. When is the Tahoe one? You don't really need one. The Tahoe one is next month, so the Bigfoot one is, so I'm doing what's called the Triple Crown. It's these three 200-mile races that are super hard and the race director that puts it on gives you a special award if you do all three of them in a summer you do them all together so each month i have a 200 mile run and have you done these this particular three set of three before so bigfoot i did bigfoot i did last year but my boyfriend i was running with him and he got really sick so i ended up dropping with him and i have finished tahoe and i have finished moab 240 so last year I did Moab, which is a 240-mile race in Utah. And then the year before I did the Tahoe 200. So I'm familiar with both of those courses. So this will be the first year that you do all three to get the special award. Exactly. Yeah. This is only second year she's having this because this is the only the second year that she's put on all three of these 200. That's why she came up with this special award, the Triple Crown, before it was just two 100s that people did and they got an award for that. But yeah, this will definitely be challenging because they're all like less than a month apart. <laughs> yeah, not a whole lot of time for recovery. But I mean, you've been doing this so long. I imagine that your body is totally yeah. used to it anyway. Well, the, the hard part is you don't get. The hard part is I don't get to train because you're kind of like not doing a lot of mileage because you want to be ready for the next yeah. one and be you know because you it does take a lot out of you to do 200 miles. You know your nutrition. It puts, I mean, I'm usually end up losing like five pounds out there, so it's like you got to eat a lot more and you don't want to just keep doing a lot of runs in between because you want to get your nutrition back up to be prepared to do that again. Amazing that you could do that kind of distance. I'm very impressed. Anybody can do this, to be honest with you. You just have to want to. That's what I tell everybody. They're like, I could never do that. And I'm like, oh, yes, you could. If you wanted to, you totally could. It's all a matter of if you want to. Like people, they're like, oh, I could never run a 50K. I go, if the wiener dog can run a 50K, you could certainly run a 50K. You just have to want to. So true. I years ago, true. Uh, about f- four years ago now, I guess, I took a year off and I bought a camper van and I took all my four dogs. I have the three dachshunds and a German shepherd and we traveled across Canada <laughs> and the U.S., in the camper van and everybody was like, Oh, I would, you know, I'd love to do that, but I can't, I have to a job. And I same as what you just said. I said, you know, if you want to, you make it work, yeah. you know, you take a leave of absence. You make it work. Yeah, you. absolutely. So I guess in Aww. the longest I've done, I just did a trifecta weekend in the Spartan races and the longest one was 23 K and that's the longest I've ever gone. I was, that's awesome. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. A lot of uphill, but well, cause it's obstacle courses. If you're yeah. doing a, that, so you're doing yeah. a lot of heavy workout in between. Yes. Getting through the <laughs> obstacle. <laughs> Briefly in my introduction, I mentioned that you've overcome addiction and obviously addiction is no joke. And we know that you've overcome a lot to overcome your demons. And now how do you respond when people say that you've replaced, you've just replaced one addiction with another? People do say that a lot, but you know what? If that's what they want to call it, then uh, it's a healthier addiction. Trust me. I mean, yeah. I'm not, you know, I don't, if I couldn't run tomorrow, I'm not going to, I mean, to me, addiction is something you have to do in your Jones. I mean, if I got sick and I couldn't run tomorrow, it's not the end of my world. And I would t- find something else to do. Say I got injured and I wouldn't be able to run again. I'd find another activity. It, it keeps me clean and sober just being outside. I don't have, you know, if I'm hiking or whatever, just being maybe I'm addicted to the wilderness. That's a better phrase, I guess, instead <laughs> of just addicted to running. It keeps me, you know, healthy and it keeps me clean and sober all these years. And it's, it's a better trade-off, I think. My and the racing part is just being out there enjoying 
it with people because I train by myself. I prefer to run alone because I see so much more when I'm by myself. Like when you're on a trail and you're talking with somebody, you know, you're not going to see all this wildlife because they're going to scatter. They hear you chit-chatting and they, they're gone. You would never see them. I see mountain lions. I see bear. I see coyotes. I see bobcats. And I see them because I'm not with somebody else unless I'm with Truman. And, you know, we see them together because he alerts me when there's something around. He just stops. I mean, I have like a little jingly collar, like three little things on there so I can hear him coming. And when I hear him stop, then I know, oh, something's around. He's notifying me, like, I'm stopping. There's something around here. And I'll look up, and I'll see a coyote or whatever. And so I then, you know, have to be aware. And I'm very aware when I'm with him, like, always scanning the horizon for other animals because he is a dog, and, you know, and people's and dogs get attacked all the time, you know, in the wilderness. So. He's so little. Yeah, <laughs> he is a little nine pounds. <laughs> Mine, mine are a little hardier. They're they're about uh, they're, they average. All my dogs were hardier. <laughs> mine are about twelve okay, pounds. The smallest one was. Yeah, that's about. Yeah, so yours are tweeny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all. Yeah, no. Wherever they're from, but yeah, I, I, it makes me feel a little more confident, like that I'm not going to step on them half the time because they're always forever under my feet. Yeah. Oh, that's really typical, right? Yeah. You're tripping over <laughs> dogs, and they're always there. You're like, get out of the way! What are you doing? <laughs> Yeah. They blend right in. Yeah, yeah. I also just re- heard that um, you completed a personal challenge of the John Muir route, and I heard someone say something about you did it as a FKT. So if you could just let us t- what an FKT yeah. means and tell us a little bit about that adventure. Sure. So an FKT is it stands for fastest known time. So this route that I did, so John Muir Trail is actually it's a wilderness trail that I have already done, but this thing that I did is called the Muir Ramble route. So John Muir, let me give you a little backstory. So John Muir, when he arrived in California, he arrived via boat, and then he took a ferry to Oakland. And then he got off the ferry, and this guy asked him, where are you going? And he goes, I want to go anywhere that's wild. And the the guy responded, well, if you go this way, this is where all the tourists are going heading to Yosemite. And he mentioned he wanted to go to Yosemite. And he goes, if you go that way, that's the wild way. Nobody goes that way. So he decided when he arrived in California, he didn't want to go the traditional route where the tourists were taking the train and then they get in the horse-drawn buggies and they head into Yosemite that way. He decided he would walk. And so I did the route that he actually walked 150 years ago. And this couple wrote a guidebook called the Mirror Ramble Route, and they walked it in 2006, and they wrote, they came up with the book in 2010, their guidebook. So I had seen this book in REI like eight years ago, and I picked it up, and I was like, I'm going to run this. I'm going to run this route. And so they made it as close as possible to the route that John Muir took because obviously some of it is like a freeway now, and you can't go on the freeway. So they brought you into these really cool places like along, you know, canals, along um, like bike trails along the bay. It was it was actually, and I thought it was going to be flat. <laughs> it was definitely a challenge. They had me going up these fire breaks, and I kept thinking, fire roads? I don't know what fire roads. I run on fire roads all the time. But a fire break is just made by tractors, and they go up straight up and straight down. It's oh. just, and they took you, and they put you on those areas through, like, sections that had highways going through it, so you didn't have to walk along the highway. But in reality, John Muir was down below on the highway because it was a toll road once upon a time. So it was really cool. So I ended up, you know, I looked into it and I couldn't find anybody that ran it. There was people that have biked it and this couple hiked it. And I actually, when I was doing it, I met a woman that was walking it as well, hiking it. And she only knew who we were because she saw my crew vehicle that had said, Muir Ramble route. And she drove up. She was only doing 10 miles a day and her and her partner were getting ready to go camp out and she's like is somebody who's doing the mirror ramble route and then i heard her and i said i am she goes i'm doing it too and i was like what and then we talked and i told her i was running it and she was walking it so not too many people have done it so when i finished i my goal was six days and i had did this four days after completing a 150 mile race which was not the smartest thing (laughs) i did a desert multi-day stage race and so i decided i'll just take it easy because it didn't really matter you know my time as long as you know, I, I, I finished to myself. If I finished in seven days, that was really good. And so that's what I did. And so I actually helped put that route on them, on the map, you know, cause people wrote a guidebook and so now it's on the fastest known time website. So if anybody else 
wants to do it, they can look at my time and my route and, you know, all my information from me doing it. And so, yeah, that's I, just a, a book I saw and I decided to do it. And so now I moved out of the Bay Area where I was living, which was near San Francisco, and I'm living on the east side of the Sierras, which is kind of on the other side of Yosemite, the back side of Yosemite. And so I'm right up against the mountains and I can, you know, be training up in the mountains, which is great. And when I first moved to Bishop, I kept seeing this logo that said the El Camino Sierra route and, or the El Camino Sierra, yeah, the El Camino Sierra route. And I was like, what the heck is this El Camino Sierra route? So I Googled it and I found out there's this 424 mile route that goes from Los Angeles all the way to Lake Tahoe. That was one of the very first mountain routes that they designated in California 150 years ago for tourists to come and drive along to come through the Sierras and the mountain ranges. So I'm going to actually run it. <laughs> I decided. Uh, four, what did you say? 420? 424 miles. Yeah. And I'm going to do it actually on September 20th. <laughs> of this year. In between my 200 mile races. <laughs> So I'm adding that into my mix of 200 mile races, by the way. Oh my goodness, you're like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> well, you only live once, right? And I have a good, I have a crew of these two guys that helped me before, and they're willing to help me again. And so I'm like, okay, let's do this. Are they the same guys that did the? Are they the they same guys? They crewed and paste. They're the ones that helped me on the um, your ramble route. So yeah, and then my boyfriend helped too. And we're gonna come by my house in Bishop so I can spend the night here at some point, and then he'll hop on and help when he's not working too. And I don't really need like the other one. I needed a lot of navigating because it was like make a left here, make a right. And it was like pretty crazy. And the, the couple that wrote the book was pretty good. Well, this is this one that I'm doing El Camino Sierra route. It, in Los Angeles, it'll be a lot of route finding to get out of there. So my, you know, my guys will have to, will have to look at the route and know where I have to make left, make a right. Like, you know, once I get on the main, the highways, then it'll be easier because there's long stretches of like, once I get onto the 395, I think I go like probably a good 80 miles on that alone. And you'll run just along miles, the side I of the think. highway? Yeah. So it's, it's pretty wide. I've driven parts of it. Like when I was just coming back. I was doing a book signing in the Bay Area, and I was driving back through near Tahoe where I'm going to be finishing. And with this shoulder, I mean, it's got plenty of shoulder, so it's pretty safe. And we'll have signs. Like, they'll drive up. Like, I won't need them every two miles like I did before. Dude, they can go six miles and wait for me, and then they could put signs out on the other side of the road to, to let, tur you know, drivers that are coming, you know, run around road so people will be prepared. But I have plenty, uh, you know, you run – facing the car so you could see mm -hmm. the cars coming at you and jump out of the way if you need to so there's just a couple of few stretches that'll be pretty slim and you know people ride their bikes along this route you know all the time it's got to be you know wearing bright colors like i do and people will be aware so i'll do that and then i'll have people come out if they want to run a little bit with me when i'm on it but it's there so i might as well do it right <laughs> why not <laughs> exactly i like that attitude <laughs> We covered this a little bit when we were talking about, you know, running with uh, with Truman. Now, did he do any kind of recovery type of um, like rehab or massage just like you do? Like when you were when he was doing his heavy training? No, you know, I'm always massaging him. It's really funny. I constantly massage him and I put like my I have muscle recovery cream that I rub on him and his paws. You know, it's really interesting People always ask me, do, does it, do you have to put boots on him? Or what do you do for his paws? Because their dog's paws are con constantly getting cracked and they bleed and stuff. He has never had a paw issue. It's just amazing how thick they must be and how, like, from day one, there's never been an issue with his paws. So I'm very blessed. But I put cream on those, too, just to lube them. And I, the only problem he gets is, like, he gets a little chafing under his harness, but we put some... The stuff that I have, uh, it's like lube cream, and I put it underneath there, and that definitely helps. But, no, he just, you know, he takes supplements. He takes some glucosamine and chondroitin and things like that, and he's fine. He never, you know, I have doggy aspirin if I feel like he's limping or something, and I can give him that. But he's just like me. I recover pretty quickly, I guess. I don't know. He is a lot like me. I guess if I was a dog, I'd be him. That is pretty impressive. Now, you did mention, like we did talk a little bit briefly about the back issues. And so when you were doing this, your vet 
was totally on board in terms of, and you did say you gave him, uh, got him some x-rays, and he's never had any kind of back issue. He hurt his, like, his back leg once, his ligament. He was, so I was standing on a rock, and he tried to jump up it, and he fell. And so I carried it, I had to carry him off the trail. And he didn't break anything or anything like that. The vent's like, oh, he just pulled a ligament, so he couldn't run then. But that's pretty much the only injury. And then we had steps, and we always, put up a you know gate because we don't want him going up and down the steps and there was a time or two that he like just came down wrong and he was kind of limpy and I'm one of those people that take my vet to the doctor to the doctor I mean my dog if he sneezes wrong he knows me really well and he's like no he's totally fine nothing's break I'm like you gotta do an x-ray and make sure he's okay and he's like nope there's nothing wrong with him it's just like you when you step wrong you twist your ankle you done stuff like that you know but nothing serious like where he was like he couldn't do anything other than the time he pulled his ligament when he fell off the rock that was the only time that he was pretty much not supposed to do anything for two weeks and I it worked out fine because he just laid around so but no very very lucky and my like I said my vet is really on board he monitors him and all about you know exercising dachshunds now (laughs) anybody who comes in he's like oh, you should probably walk a couple of miles a day with your dog or, you know but before he was like no these dogs you know shouldn't do anything because that's what they're taught in vet school that they're just not good for doing long distance but it's amazing that how many people are now like i said they they've owned dachshunds for years and they never thought about you know they have another running dog they'll take their other dogs running and then they have a dachshund and they're like oh we just left our we leave a dachshund at home because it's just a little dog but now they're running with him so i i have that same opinion i um, i here where i am we have winter so it can get pretty cold oh yeah yeah no, it, it can cold. get pretty cold and snowy and i walk my guys spring summer winter and fall like they just wear a jacket and i just put some uh, a cream on their feet to protect from the salt and off we go so i've always had that mindset but that's good. None of, I think, I don't know. I have, uh, my friends joke that I'm a pretty active person, but I have like the laziest dogs. <clears throat> my German Shepherd won't even run. <laughs> like, it's crazy. <laughs> I have to find the right <laughs> training partner. <laughs> so, I, yeah, that's my, funny. Yeah. Like, my one guy, Baby Wiener or Vinny, he's a uh, smooth and he's about my most active. And I did take him out the one day for a 5K. And I mean, he, he went, but. He was like, whatever, I could take it or leave it. He's more happy to just walk. Eventually, I'm sure I'll find one of my my lifeline that will eventually run with me. (laughs) That's my goal. Like I said, I don't know. (laughs) Truman trained himself, and I'm actually going to, I'm looking at getting another dachshund for Truman, like a buddy that he can hang out with. Are you looking at? We're working on that. At a rescue? Yeah, because he's he's 12, and I feel like he needs to have somebody he can teach now. And he, he's, his other two dachshunds that he used to live with, he loves hanging out with them. And I just feel like he needs a, he needs to teach somebody. He needs to be in charge of somebody because he doesn't, he's the low man still. He needs to be up above. So when we lived with our, my old roommate a few years ago, when he got his last, uh, dachshund that he fostered and then he decided to adopt. Truman was in charge of that guy. His name was Kyler. So Truman had somebody that he could boss around at one point in his life. So that's why I'm like, oh, he needs another another guy to boss around. So, But he's funny. Like, if we go and visit them now, if either one of the my old roommate's dogs come up to me, Truman will growl at them. He doesn't want any other dogs next to me. It's so funny to see him do that. But it's only since he's lived on his own, like when he moved away from them in the last two years, he's become more confident it's funny he barks when somebody knocks at the door or he'll bark when somebody comes in the house and for all of his life when he lived there for four years he did not bark he did not growl he did not do any of that so he's like finally you know he's turned into a a little bit more of a dog (laughs) or a dachshund i should say (laughs) that's funny and he's getting like that with food he never used to be a food guy and now he's like well after he finishes his food he's like over at our food wanting to eat and he never was like that you know and it's like get away go sit down (laughs) so what do you feed him so i feed him so he eats a free wheat free um dog food i feed him the castor and pollock senior formula and then he eats a i mix in a wet food with that and then i give him fish oil and i give him probiotics in his food and stuff like that too so that works really good because i was giving him one that wasn't necessarily, you know, gluten-free and all of that when I first got him for the first year. And his, 
skin. He has kind of a, a skin condition, almost like an eczema, and now it's completely cleared. So food that I give him is soy free, gluten free, and all of that, and it works really well for him. And I started him on the senior formula because I was giving him the regular formula, the smaller kibble, and he started eating poop, his poop. And I was like, <laughs> oh, gross. So I took him to the fast. I'm like, why is he eating his poop? I have to clean the poop up right away. Or it might have been the cat poop in the yard, you know, but a couple of times he came in with pieces of poop. And I was like, this is disgusting. And he goes, what are you feeding him? And then I told him, he goes, no, you need a senior formula that has more fiber in it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> And so I started him on the senior formula, and he never did that again. For anybody yeah. out there that's listening. Said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if your dog is eating poop, and, well, I guess a lot of people's dogs eat poop, because I, when I said that, a lot of my friends are like, no, our dog eats poop, too. And I was like, no, I don't want my dog doing that. But, yeah, they say that um, you, you definitely, as they get older, a senior formula is pretty important. And I didn't even think about that, you know, because I, I hate to admit that he's a senior <laughs> is the problem yeah like no he's a puppy you know because i did adopt him when he was six and i was like oh i don't want to get one that's six years old the next time i want one that's three so that way i have more time with him but he's doing really good and i mean that's the worst thing for us dog owners is our dog don't live forever live as long as people you know and we have to know that you know when we rescue them that they're not going to be here forever He's doing good, and I hope he lives to be like twenty. <laughs> be happy, but but he's had a good life so far. So with you know the last six years have been the best, I'm sure, six years of his life, and he's gone more places than most people. So very true. I agree. I'm pretty sure that yeah. your the six years he's been with you have totally canceled out the other six. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He's like doesn't even remember. <laughs> That's awesome. You eat as well a plant based diet, correct? Yes, I do. Yeah. I'm vegan. And so how did you transition or how did you become what made you decide to becoming a vegan? Growing up, I, we raised animals and I was in 4-H and all of that. And so at a young age, we had some cattle and one ended up in our freezer. And my parents were always telling me, don't name those. Those are not pets. You know, and I was like, no, oh, I'm naming this one. And so I became aware of like not wanting to eat animals because they were you know I was naming them as my pet so when I was like nine he ended up Charlie it is his name ended up in the freezer and I decided I'm not ever eating hamburger again so it started kind of early you know because I was in 4-H and raising animals and then the next year I sold my lamb and then I was like oh I'm not eating lamb anymore so it kind of started transitioning young and I was vegetarian up until I got arrested. So I had been a vegetarian for many, many years. And me and a friend of mine were talking about going vegan. And so when I got arrested for selling drugs and got clean and sober, I decided, you know what? Today, when I got out of jail, I'm going to become vegan. And so I started reading up on veganism. And went, the, pretty much the day I got out of jail, I became a vegan. So the day I got clean and sober, I became vegan. And that actually, that I think helped me a lot because when you're not eating healthy, you know, that affects your mental state too. You know, you're eating crap. And when I became vegan in the beginning, I was an unhealthy vegan because there's lots of unhealthy vegan options out there. Believe it or not, you know, it's like people are like, I'm vegan. And it's like, wait, you got a whole basket of vegan cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I became aware of trying to eat healthier. And so, yeah, I became vegan right then and there. And, and it just gave me something to focus on and eating, learning about, you know, what, what I'm putting in my body because getting off of drugs and alcohol, I decided, you know, I'm going to put only healthy stuff in my body. So yeah, I've been a vegan for 25 years now. I am also vegan. And I did notice, Good. I did notice a, a difference in my running energy. Absolutely. That was the last straw that made me realize like this is the best way for me to eat was having so much more energy on my runs like I would never have considered doing a 23 kilometer run ever in my life I think the longest I'd ever done is about a 5 10k and that was plenty and now I'm like oh let's go longer I mean, makes a big difference look at your skin too your skin is much better I mean everything is is better when you became vegan I mean your skin starts looking clearer and healthier and things like that I just tell people because people are like you're 53. What what do you use on your skin? I said, well, I use healthy, you know, clean vegan skincare. And I said, but it's the way I eat. I mean, it's obviously everything you put in your mouth can come out on your skin too. You know, the way you look. As we know, um, 
as dachshund owners and wiener dog mom, you know that we love to share stories of antics, uh, the fun antics about our little wiener dogs. Do you have any fun little stories that you might want to share about Truman? Oh my God, Truman. He has many stories. <laughs> we actually, so when I first got him, like I said, he didn't bark for years. And we actually, we ran, we did this run with six other people for, uh, mental health awareness and we ran across the United States and it, we did it in 24 days. So we did it as like a relay and Truman was actually on our team and he ran a few miles every day with me. He never barked or anything then. And it's like, he started barking when people would come into the hotel room or knock on the door. So it was like, people were like, wait a minute, he didn't bark at all before. And I go, no, he's become very protective. Just from doing that, he became really protective of me. And, People like when we're out, like having coffee and stuff, he'll wander over to other people's tables. And this is a dog that never used to be this way, so that's why I'm saying this is really funny for me to see how how insecure and how fr- afraid of everything and everybody he was when I first got him. Now he just like I'll go into the coffee shop and it, his leash, if it'll leech and uh, reach to another table, he'll go up and try to sit in people's laps and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm so sorry. And they're like, no, he's so sweet. <laughs> that is really inspiring inspiring because a lot of people are hesitant about taking in you know rescues with any kind of issue so just showing that you know with a little bit of work that they can really come along and really come out of their shell so that's uh gives a, people looking it's at true absolutely I, I love that story because and i i definitely my next rescue i want somebody similar i mean i want to take on a challenge i want you know i'm gonna look for that shy dog the dog that doesn't have a lot of you know, confidence. And because that's what Truman can teach the dog. And that's why when we got uh, Truman, my roommate's dog, Sky, is a very confident and outgoing dog. So even the rescue, the North Carol Dachshund rescue, they were like, oh, Sky could teach this dog. You know, she's a good teacher. That would be a perfect fit for Truman to come live there and get more confident with this other dog. And so now it's his turn to teach another dog to be confident, you know, because it's funny that he had no confidence and and dogs teach each other stuff. So that's why I'm like, I want to get another guy, you know, and I keep looking and I emailed the people that I used to do dogs and rescue with. And they're, I'm six hours drive away from them, but she's keeping her eye out on a, a similar Truman story for me. So that'll be my next guy that's similar to Truman. That's great. Thrilled that you're still looking at a rescue. There's a wait, wiener yeah. dog out there waiting for you. <laughs> There's a lot of them, and I wish I could take them all. <laughs> I know we're pretty. Lucky. Our house is really big now. I told my, I told my boyfriend. I said, God, I said I could do a whole wiener dog rescue out of Bisha. He's like, Oh God. The only <laughs> problem is I, I run and I don't have a lot of time. So this, the next wiener dog is gonna have to be small enough to fit in a pack too, just like Truman, because it's gonna be going in the mountains. Yeah. So it's got to learn to love being in the nature. Yeah. So and that's why I keep looking for one that's the same size, like. No more than 10 pounds because I've had to put two dachshunds in a pack and they both will fit. Yeah. When I was ready to add a dachshund back into my family, I wanted uh, I wanted a dapple. I wanted a black and tan dapple. I wanted it to be male and yeah. I didn't want it to be a puppy. And my friends were all like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> you're not asking for much. <laughs> and I put it out there and sure enough, two of them showed up, a dad and a son. So if you, if you oh wait. Oh my God, a dad and a son. Yeah. So, uh, and they look identical so much so that I have to put that they're called, they're color coded so that people can look at their color, their oh, color no. and know which one is which. Yeah. So if you oh, put it out so there, cute. it'll show up for you. <laughs> well, I'm looking for a pie ball. Well, <laughs> so there you go. My next one. I, yeah. I keep saying I want a little boy pie ball. So yeah, they'll show up. There's been a couple that have come through on the rescue and they just, they got swiped up right away. That's why I told my rescue lady Lindy I'm like make sure you put me you know on the list there I definitely want one so <laughs> well now it's yeah, out I there. think that that would be a nice yeah I love Truman's a dapple and he's different and unique and I thought you don't I mean you see pie balls but you you don't see a lot of them so I thought oh you know and a lot of people get puppies and they get pie balls a lot of older people and they get sick and then they their family members can't take these dogs that's how a lot of them come in the rest would like to get one like that and then just work with it. 
So, so I'm putting it out there. Yes, eyeballs come to me. <laughs> Truman's <laughs> next brother. <laughs> um, one of the things that I thought it was so amazing, Katra, is that you truly do live your life on your own terms. Uh, just like our little wiener dogs, you have multiple tattoos and piercings and you run in <laughs> colorful clothing. And what would you just say to young girls out there that, you know, maybe struggling with their own self-esteem that, you know, might that they find it hard with navigating this world of social media and trying to fit in? What would you suggest to them? I would tell them, just learn to love yourself. You are enough. You know, don't look at people's, especially, yes, you're right, with social media now, it's so, it's so much harder for, I think, young girls. It was hard enough for us when we were young, you know, um, these images of women in the magazines and on the cover of Vogue. And, you know, that's not reality. And I actually have had friends that were supermodels. That is not reality. That's not not how people really look. I mean, even with the makeup on, it's all airbrush. It's not, it's all fake. People can fake the way they look in photos now. You know, you see these photos, photos of people on Instagram or wherever, and it's not really how they look in person. You can fluff your picture. It's like, just love yourself. Be happy with yourself. And when you're happy with yourself, good things happen. And, and I want to, you know, especially for young girls, find something that you love doing, whether it be dance or sports and, and, and just find something that's going to build your confidence, you know, because that's really important and that'll take you far. And if you can find a sport that you like, so that's even better because it, that can get you places to, into a college and, you know, things like that. And it's a good confidence booster. And it's just like go out and have fun and look at I Running is fun. You can look at me and I make running fun. And running out on a trail and in the wilderness can definitely be fun. Perfect. Before we get to our last uh, question, Catcher, where can people follow you? They can follow me on Instagram, Dirt Diva 333, or on Twitter, Dirt Diva 33, or on Facebook. I have an athlete page that they can follow me on, and it's just under Catcher. And Truman actually has a page, too. Perfect. The Dirt Doxy. So if you just put in oh. Dirt Doxy, <laughs> Truman will, his handle will come up. Yeah, so he has his own Facebook page. And everybody's like, oh, he needs an Instagram, but it's just like, now it's like me and him together is enough, you know, it's like it's, it's too hard to navigate all these different counts with the different dogs and yeah. the different things going on in my life. I mean, Truman can just be on Instagram with me. He doesn't need his own personal Instagram. He, he gets to be online. <laughs> yeah. And you're always together. So your pictures are both of you. So <laughs> yes, exactly. But I'll tell you what, when I just put a picture of him by himself, it gets more likes than me and him in the picture <laughs> or if I'm in the picture. <laughs> so it just doesn't show you yet. Truman gets way more likes than by himself without me in a photo. <laughs> <laughs> One final question that I kind of ask everybody, Katra, is dogs are such amazing teachers. So what would you say is the most important thing that you've learned from having a wiener dog in your life? Oh, wow. A lot. Patience and actually inspiration from Truman. You know, it's like that little dog inspires me so much. I mean, when I'm struggling just in anything in life, I look at him or think of him and I'm like, there is not, I mean, there's no reason to struggle. Look at how little he is and what he's been through and his life and look what he's done. It's like, you can certainly put one foot in front of the other and get out the door and don't be depressed and smile and enjoy life. Cause look at him, he's enjoying life and he never complains. <laughs> That's Amazing. We do truly find such inspiration in them. I'm I'm so happy that he's found you, that you that you're together. He picked me. I'm glad he picked me. <laughs> uh you know what? That is we're just gonna end with that. <laughs> Thank you so awesome. much, Katra. This was awesome. Once again, Katra's book is Reborn on the Run. It's the perfect read while having a tea and cuddling on the couch with your dachshund. If you have a wiener dog story, an event, or a topic you'd like to see us cover, send an email, bark at wienerdoglover.com. Follow us on Instagram, wiener underscore dog underscore lover underscore, or Twitter at Loving Wiener Dog, or find us on Facebook, Wiener Dog Lover. Never miss an episode. Head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe, and you'll be notified every time we put out a new podcast. I'd also be grateful if you would leave us a review. Until next time, wiener dog lovers, this is Lori, Sheba, and the wieners signing off. <laughs>